I will let people in. And then, yeah. Nadine, you know already, you start. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When we have some people there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Have a nice meeting. Milton, can we start? Yes, Nadini, please. Okay, so good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, depending on the time zones you are in. So today we have a medical professional speaking to us about a very specific topic that is about a frog pathogen. And the talk is named On the Trail of a Frog Killer. The speaker is Dr. Michael Dillon, lecturer in infection and immunity at the Peninsula School of Medicine at University of Plymouth, UK. 
Michael is a lecturer at the Peninsula Medical School. He teaches infectious disease pathogenesis and immunology over a range of medical for a range of medical programs, including the Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery programs, Physicians Associates, and the MSc Global Health Program. And he is not only a doctor but also a vivid researcher. He has previously developed multiple in vitro diagnostic test kits for early detection of human and veterinary pathogens in resource poor settings. So in onward, till now we have been hearing about the different pathogens, how to tackle the water associated diseases. And now we have a very specific, it may appear to be a different topic, but a very related topic. And I'm pleased to have Dr. Michael Dillon here. So the floor is yours, Michael. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, if I start the presentation there. Um, yeah, not a lot to add, just more thank you again for the, the very kind introduction. Um, to highlight, so talking to the team at Onwards, you know, I, I understand traditionally you've looked at, at waterborne pathogenesis and waterborne diseases. So we thought we'd maybe do something slightly different. This is work that I've done maybe about five years ago when I was based at the University of Exeter. Um, and it was a joint project between the University of Exeter and the Whitley Wildlife Conservation Trust. Um, and then we had several other um, collaborators join in with us. Um, but yeah, we thought we'd try something new, talk about frogs. For a change, a little bit out there, a strange, a strange topic, um, but I think one that we'll find is is really relevant and pertinent, especially to waterborne diseases. So I'm going to first talk about the what we're calling the great amphibian decline, global extinction in our time. I'm going to follow that up with an introduction to something called Batrachochytrium dendrobatitis which henceforth I will call BD. It's quite a mouthful. Um, and that is a waterborne fungal disease. And I'll talk about some of the work we did a few years ago to develop a diagnostic test kit for BD infection and why that's important. So one of the first things that um, people always ask me is, <laughs> what, what, what is this global amphibian decline? There's over five, well, there, there were over 5,700 species of amphibian, but since 1980, over a third of them have been experiencing rapid decline. So that's almost 2,000 species that have either gone extinct, gone extinct in the wild, but there's still some in captive breeding programs, like at the zoo, um, and some that have potentially gone extinct. So we haven't seen them in the wild. It's not been long enough to really declare them extinct, but they, they might be, but we're not sure. These mass extinctions are being called the most spectacular loss of vertebrate biodiversity in recorded history. And I just, I can't think of a better way to put that. That's from Professor Lee Scarrett at the University of Melbourne, who's been at the forefront of a lot of this um, amphibian decline research over the many years. And the second question I get, all right, so the frogs are going extinct, but big deal. Why do we care? They're frogs. <laughs> um, but to give you a bit of perspective here, so amphibians have been on the planet for at least 300 million years. Humans, maybe about 6 million years. So another perspective, there have been five mass extinction events on Earth. We're currently undergoing the sixth, but amphibians have survived the four most recent ones. So they're historically an insanely resilient species. We're talking one species going extinct at a rate of about 250 years historically. But now we're seeing one species completely disappear every 66 days, a little over two months. So it's this analogy, this canary in a coal mine, what is causing such a resilient species to suddenly go extinct at such a rapid rate? This guy here, um, I do apologize for some of my pronunciations. I will butcher their names. Um, his name is Beasel Bufo Antigna, or better known as the Armored Devil Toad. So he's about 10 inches across and was actually around when dinosaurs roamed the earth. 
from the Devonian um, and also through the Triassic and Jurassic periods. So he is about 10 inches long, gets his name from a very strong jaw, these two little horns at the top and some thick armored plating under his skin. Uh, you can see this artist rendition, you know, it's not hard to imagine this giant frog hopping around eating baby dinosaurs back in the Jurassic period. Another big important reason though, you know, amphibians are an important source of food for most of the world. The United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization estimates that 47 metric tons of frog are consumed each year. So to give you an idea, you know, a, a cow is about a metric ton. So that's 47 cows worth of frog every year. Um, this guy, he's actually a big guy. He's called Leptodactylus phallus, the mountain chicken frog. And he's from the Caribbean islands, one of the largest species of frog ever recorded. The legs can grow up to 21 centimeters long. And it's estimated that, you know, at least 8,000 to 30,000 were consumed each year um, as food until hunting was banned outright in 2003 because it was being overhunted and combined with infectious disease through the community um, was completely decimating the species. Unfortunately, you know, that's what, 18, 19 years ago, uh, almost 20 years ago, I guess now, and that this species is still critically endangered um, and seeing declines, again, from illegal hunting and from disease. We owe a lot of our understanding of human biology to frogs. So they have more in common with humans than most other vertebrates, and they've been a very popular model for developmental biology. For example, this one, this is the African clawed frog, Xenopus. Um, he taught us basically how neurons connect to nerves. So we have a much better understanding of how the brain communicates with the eye. And that research has led to treatments, for example, macular degeneration. Xenopus was also the first vertebrate to ever be cloned, for which Sir John Gurdon won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2012. And I'll swing back around to this, but Xenopus was one of the early home pregnancy tests. Maybe not home pregnancy tests, but um, physicians would keep cages of Xenopus. And if a patient was suspected pregnant, they would put a bit of urine on the frog. And if the frog started to ovulate, they said, ah, we know you're pregnant. Uh, not just developmental biology, but also medical and pharmaceutical advances. Um, so amphibians have these small antimicrobial peptides all over their skin, and different species have different peptides. And the compounds have the potential to treat severe or several human diseases. So for example, um, peptides isolated from the rana species of frog are potent inhibitors of HIV. So you can imagine in this era of intense antimicrobial resistance all across the globe, you know, having access, being able to research these different peptides uh, on frogs that are actually out there in the living world uh, is, could be tremendously beneficial. In another example, this picture is the Ecuadorian poison dart frog, and he produces a natural painkiller 200 times more effective than morphine without all of the addictive side effects. The researchers researchers are hoping to study the compound to prevent drug addiction in humans. It's a bit difficult, 200 times more effective. That's a very limit, small limit for overdose, um, but it's really fascinating that there's no um, addictive side effects. This is a great example of how extinction has prevented maybe some modern medical advances. This frog was called Rio Batrachus. And he was really unique because instead of laying his eggs in a pond or in a pool of water, he would actually rear them in his belly. So um, in order to achieve this, Rio Petrakas had to actually turn off stomach acid production. Um, and then the frogs would live in his belly or the tadpoles until they were, they were fully grown and ready to hop out. Um, the whole community was really abuzz when this frog was discovered. Everybody thought, oh, this is really cool. We might learn something about stomach ulceration, how to treat gas gastric reflux, but unfortunately, 
Rio Petrocus went extinct a few years after discovery, and all of that potential is now gone. They're also important to our ecosystems. So being both aquatic and terrestrial animals, they transfer, for example, nitrogen from one community to the other uh, for use by plants. They also eat pests. This is a very, very big guy called the cane toad that's been introduced to several islands in the Pacific and Oceania to protect sugarcane from pests. So it will eat mice, sometimes rats, and giant moths. It's not the best example, I'll be honest. It's a classic example of maybe this frog is starting to overstep his ecological boundary, what he was introduced to do. Turns out he's extremely toxic and is beginning to take over in some areas where they don't necessarily want him. But he is extremely useful for protecting crops from pests. Maybe a little bit more in line with onward, um, amphibians eat insects that spread disease. That includes things like mosquitoes. So there's a correlation between amphibian populations and dengue mosquitoes, malarial mosquitoes, and they can also eat snails and slugs that harbor other parasites and diseases. And then they have traditionally and still are important cultural icons. If we think back to the ancient Egyptians, frogs were considered a symbol of fertility and life. To the ancient Greeks, frogs were a symbol of promiscuity and sex, and medieval Europeans thought they were associated with witchcraft. The Vietnamese believed that the toad was the uncle to the sky in their mythos. And so we can see frogs and salamanders and different amphibians have always been important culturally across cultures. Um, we see them on cave drawings, we see them in canvases, embroidered into clothes, molded into pins, pipes, Native American tribes used to mold salamanders into smoking pipes. And, you know, modern day songs, fables. Here we have Disney, the princess and the frog. But they've been on decline for several years. And there's three main reasons. Um, I'll briefly touch on the three of them before we really start to talk about the infectious disease aspect. Um, but the first is reduced habitat. So um, especially in Europe and America, as these countries become more urbanized, um, there's less places for frogs to live. And as more of their habitat is turned into farmland, for example, cattle can trample, trample on the grass and overgraze. Also, despite having sort of national forests or safe zones, uh, pesticide runoff and wind can blow residues into these safe areas that can still impact frog populations. There's actually a really cool study that came out of Australia a few years ago um, where they used some, some really interesting citizen science to monitor the biodiversity and the number of frogs in both urban versus rural settings. And they found that actually in the city, there were 60% fewer frogs and 80% less diversity not only are we reducing the number of frogs, we're actually reducing the number of species that can thrive. A second key cause is overexploitation. So I mentioned earlier, a lot of frogs are consumed for food. Um, several are also used for bait, for example, for fishing. And then many are hunted for pets or sold to enthusiasts, especially from Asian countries. You get a lot of really gorgeous frogs. They're very colorful, maybe this metallic sheen or yellows and reds and oranges. Um, and so to give you an idea, South Korea, for example, catches and exports over 34,000 oriental fire-bellied toads each year. That's 34,000 every year that are coming out of the environment and being sent so people can use them as pets, essentially. Lovely picture of some frog legs. And again, exotic pet stores then stock these um, and sell them to people to put in terrariums in their house. I don't know if this exact pet store does, it's just a representative example. I'm not calling them out. And then finally, the third is this enigmatic decline. And I wouldn't say so much that it's enigmatic anymore. Traditionally, these were species that were going extinct and nobody knew why. Now we can largely attribute that to B 
BD, so Batrachochytrium dendrobotitis. Um, BD is a chytrid fungus, and chytrid fungi are one of the earliest diverging fungal lineages. Uh, they're heterotrophs, so they get carbon from other life sources, not the sun, and they're saprophytes and they're parasites. So they're absolutely essential to the ecosystem. Uh, they're very important for decomposing dead decaying matter and recycling it back into the environment. Unfortunately though, somewhere along the way, BD has become this sort of modal pathogen that can cause disease in amphibians. And well, instead of decomposing dead decaying matter, it's actually doing it to live, live animals. If we look at the life cycle, BD starts as a little zoospore, and it's aquatic. It swims around in rivers, lakes, ponds, and it's very, very attracted to keratin, super attracted to keratin, which is one of the major components of frog skin. So it swims around, it finds some keratin, and it burrows into the skin and develops into a thallus. You can think of this as just a tiny little sac. That thallus then matures into a sporangium. And think of that as a bigger sac that starts to bulge and pulsate. And over about four or five days, eventually that sporangium just bursts open and hundreds more zoospores now can are released. And they can either reinfect the same frog and cause chronic disease, or they can swim off and find new frogs uh, to infect and cause disease in. And there's a really cool video, you can actually watch it, that um, some friends at Imperial College London, Dr. Matt Fisher, who was helping us on this project, um, he was actually filming this in a Petri dish. So these little black dots that are swimming around, these are our zoospores, and they're swimming around, they're on the hunt for some keratin. Once they find some skin, they burrow in and develop into a sporangium, and you can see it starts to pulsate. So all of these little dots in the sporangium, those are zoospores that are developing. And eventually they reach this critical mass. And if you look at the top here, this little kind of ejection tube where they start to burst their way out of the sporangium um, to go off and infect. So here's now, here the sporangium is empty. And all of these dots, these zoospores have now gone off to develop into their own. So you can really see, you know, if the entire life cycle is about four days, you can see this exponential growth, how quickly all of that happens. Starting from just a single zoospore, in a week or two, you have hundreds of thousands. BD is on every continent except Antarctica. Largely, we expect because there are no frogs on Antarctica. Um, but through genetic tracing, it's believed to originated in South Africa, um, largely through, and then spread, largely through the global Xenopus trade. So Xenopus actually grows, doesn't become infected by DD, BD. It's a bit of a, I wouldn't say commensal organism, but they don't seem to have a problem cohabitating. Um, but as Xenopus was shipped across the world, um, scientific research, for use in pregnancy testing. One example is it brought BD with it. And actually, Xenopus was so over farmed, um, over hunted at one point, that it was almost extinct in the wild. And people, scientists and researchers, and even physicians were breeding their own little stocks of Xenopus. Um, but then, you know, as technology advanced, as maybe we didn't need a frog as an animal model, or as we had pregnancy tests, um, some of those frogs for example, maybe got released back into the wild. There's other examples of researchers inadvertently passing BD from population to population, maybe somebody going hiking and not cleaning the bottom of their boots, stepped in some muddy water. And um, again, nobody knew about it. Nobody was really thinking about it or looking for it. And a lot of this happened accidentally. Because of how widespread it is and how dangerous it is, to these other species of frog that haven't come in contact with it before. The World Organization of Animal Health has classified BD as a notifiable disease, which means that member countries have to test for BD on all exported and imported amphibians. That said, there aren't 
very many member countries of the WO, AH, and they have no power to enforce their guidelines. They can only say, this is what you need to do, but they have no power to make or to compel members to actually do it. So there's not actually a lot, if any, testing going on between this global amphibian trade. So we talked a little bit about the skin is one of the most, is probably the most important organ on a frog. And that's because that's where it gets all of its water. So you'll never see a frog go to a water bowl and lap water up with its tongue like a dog. If it's thirsty or if it needs water, it actually just goes and sits in a puddle of water and soaks it up like a sponge. Or maybe it goes for a swim. But you can see if we look at this electron micrograph of infected frog skin, you can see this constant, you know, release of zoospores burrowing in, sporangium, you know, release of zoospores burrowing in. It creates this like chronic scarring and thickening of the skin. And that then disrupts the electrolyte balance because frogs can no longer soak up water like they're used to. Ultimately, you know, you get this disrupted electrolyte balance, heart attack, and death. It sounds all a bit doom and gloom at this point. I just wanted to point out that with a proper diagnosis, BD is perfectly treatable. This little frog is sat in a little puddle of um, antifungals and you give a small treatment, maybe you know, 10 minutes a day for a week and usually the frog will come out all right. And minimal side effects, again, frog skin is incredibly delicate and their most important organism. And just like us, they have lots of commensal organisms. And so popping them into an antifungal bath does kill some of the good stuff with the bad stuff. But overall, they can live a long and healthy life and be generally um, all right with proper treatment. This is where it becomes a bit tricky though. We're talking about diagnosis. So there are really no hallmark symptoms. They're quite ambiguous. So you don't get a cyst or skin rash or a change of color. Actually, the two hallmark symptoms are lethargy, or lethargy and loss of writing reflex. So that means the frog gets a bit lazy, um, which having worked with frogs for several years, I can honestly tell you, I, I couldn't tell the difference between a lazy frog and an active frog. They're all lazy to me. They don't move, um, at least not when you're around. Um, loss of writing reflex is a little bit more obvious. So that's when they can't hop in a straight line. They sort of lose their balance and they're kind of, they're a little bit erratic. But again, because they don't move very often, it's really difficult to tell. QPCR is the gold standard. So you swab the frog and then you run a PCR test to look for chytrid or BD DNA. The problem here is it's really expensive. We're talking 40, 20 to 40 pounds per test. And you have to think you need, a, you need quite expensive uh, reagents and equipment, a PCR machine, somebody trained to do it. You need swabs and reagents and, you know, and if I'm gonna be completely frank, there's not a lot of money here for cons conservation, for protecting and screening frog species. So you may swab, you know, several frogs in a colony um, and you could be spending hundreds of pounds just to get them tested. The other real issue here is that it takes a while, right? You have to swab it, it needs to be sent off to the lab, the lab needs to test it, and then it needs to be, you need to get the results back. In that time period, if you're looking at wild populations, that frog has long been released back into the wild. And nobody has time, nobody can hold on to the frog for that many days or months even sometimes. Um, again, because it's quite expensive, and so the places that do do PCR testing, they're usually charities or they're you know researchers who can't do it you know on site. The second standard is histology. So this is actually a slice of frog skin, and you can see these arrows pointing to some sporangium with the really dark purple being zoospores that are inside, getting ready to be released. It's useful but it's also not very useful not on a live frog anyway you're not going to exactly go skin a frog and um, a live frog to find out if it's sick or not and um, some places will do a toe clipping so you can take a toe and look 
But again, then you're only looking at a very small subset of that animal skin to try to tell if it's infected or not. And that can be difficult to do. So this is where we came in. Again, this was sort of a, a project between the, the Whitley Wildlife Conservation Trust and the University of Exeter to develop a much more rapid and on-site way to diagnose BD in animals. I don't really need to run this video, I'd say anymore. I feel like we're all experts at lateral flow assays after the pandemic, um, but it works again, much like your COVID test. You put a liquid sample onto a sample pad, capillary action pulls it across a series of membranes and you have a test line and a control line. So one line is positive, uh, I'm sorry, one line is negative, two lines is positive. But if we zoom in at a microscopic level and look at how these guys work, so lateral flow assays detect antigen. In the COVID example, we were looking for a bit of COVID. And we said, if you've got a bit of COVID in your nose or in your throat, that means you probably have the whole thing and we're gonna classify you as infected. For the frogs, we're looking for a bit of BD. So we say, if a frog has BD, a bit of it on them, that means they probably have the whole thing on them. So here we have a series of overlapping membranes. We put a small liquid sample onto a sample pad. And if it has an antigen in it, if it has a bit of BD, capillary action will pull that BD across to a conjugate pad. Here it will interact with some labeled antibodies. So these are small proteins that are designed to be incredibly specific, in this case to BD. They don't recognize anything else. And they've been put a little bead, a gold bead has been put on them so that we can see them with the naked eye. Capillary action then pulls that complex down to the test line where we have another immobilized antibody and we build a sandwich. So we have an antibody that binds to BD and then another antibody that binds to BD with a gold label on it. And that gold label makes that rich red color that we see on the test. If there is no BD in our sample, then capillary action just pulls those antibodies right across the other ones and you get one line, you get a negative result. And that's because there's, there's no sandwich. There's no BD to build, to, to sandwich between the two antibodies. So there's nothing to see. Now I won't get into the nitty gritty detail about how we develop the antibody. Um, all of that's in the paper, if it's something you're particularly interested in. I will say probably like most fungi, um, BD is incredibly, incredibly immunoreactive um, and it doesn't take much, no adjuvant even, um, to get a very robust immune response. Um, we isolated in this example over 40 hybridoma cell lines and then began to characterize them for all sorts of different criteria to find out if they were stable, uh, what kind of media they grew well in, but for the talk and for the paper, we selected this antibody here, uh, MAP5C4. Now this allows both design a lateral flow assay, but also learn a little bit more about BD itself. So Western blot analysis showed that MAP5C4 was recognizing a glycoprotein or a carbohydrate. And we see this banding pattern which is very indicative. Most fungal and several bacteria have glycoproteins on the surface. So it's not uncommon to have like a carbohydrate capsule. Um, and that is indicated by a banding pattern on a Western blot. And we can see you get a different banding pattern based on the life stage of BD that you're testing. So for example, the zoospores versus the sporangium. We also can see that it recognizes something called BS or B cell. And we'll loop back around to that in a few minutes. So when we began to explore, again, there was not a, a ton out there known about BD, um, but we discovered that this glycoprotein, um, it's carbohydrate glycoprotein, and it's found on the surface of the fungus. It's in a lot of abundance. So we can see here is a, a thallus, and you can see this carbohydrate is just all over the surface everywhere. And we also discovered that it's in all life stages. 
So here's a sporangium that's getting ready to burst, and you can see lots of um, carbohydrate, this capsule, all over the surface. And again, here's a zoospore. We zoom really way in, and you can see it's all over. Um, so it's in a huge abundance. We also found that it is excreted into culture medium. So it kind of, maybe not excreted, but it definitely falls off as the fungus is growing um, and multiplying. And we discovered that it's synthesized intracellularly. So looking at some electron micrographs. Now that in and of itself isn't particularly groundbreaking. Most things that have a carbohydrate capsule, they get produced intracellularly, exported to the surface. Um, but what this did tell us was that the antibody sort of recognized one of the base components of this glycoprotein or carbohydrate chain. So a lot of these carbohydrate chains, they're a series of repeating epitopes. It's the same epitope over and over and over again to make a long chain. And we're recognizing one of those very specific epitopes. We're not sure which, we just know we're, we're, we're seeing one, probably one of the repeating ones. We also know that this carbohydrate is not found in, can't say all species, but in many species. So we had to make sure that the antibody would not cross-react with other fungi commonly found in a frog's environment. Um, so, you know, especially different soil-dwelling fungus, uh, freshwater molds, for example, um, Zygomyces, Basidiomyces, Zascomyces, really just lots of excuses for me to put some pretty pictures of um, fungi on the screen. I do think they look really cool. Um, but what we did find as we were going through the study that the antibody recognized a something called the Trachochytrium salamandriverans. So BS or B-sal is an evolution of BD that was discovered in 2013 after wiping out much of the Netherlands fire salamander population. So that's a picture of a fire salamander. They're quite pretty. There's not a whole lot of research about B-cell yet. Again, you have to, in, in the scope of um, research funding, frog and salamander conservation doesn't take a lot of priority at the moment. So we don't know a whole lot about it, but we do know that it causes similar symptoms in salamanders as, it, as BD causes in frogs. Um, so we don't think that it's necessarily a bad thing that our antibody recognizes both. They're both treated the same way and they're both incredibly devastating and dangerous. So no matter what the animal has, BD or b cell, we can treat it the same way and we definitely want to treat it. In fact, going through all of these different um, species, the only thing, there are two things that we actually found that our antibody cross-reacted with. One was trichosporon. And again, these are soil dwelling yeast. And we had to really concentrate this sample in order to get it to cross-react. So um, we don't believe that it was this cross-reactivity is really indicative of um, a real life situation. There'd have to be so much of this stuff on the frog. Um, we're talking like caked on quite thick. To, for the test to give a, a false positive result. And the other one here is this one called homophylactis. Um, not a whole lot known about this one. Um, it's a chytrid. We know it's possibly through genetic uh, analysis that it's possibly BD and B cells closest known phylogenetic relative. But as far as we're aware, it's only ever been found once at an acidic lake in Maine where it was isolated from pine tree needles. So it's a very, very um, specific and very limited in its distribution. It's not really been found anywhere else. So from a, you know, honestly, we don't know if it causes disease in amphibians or if it did, how you would treat it. Can only assume the same way, um, but because it's not known to be exactly widespread, um, we don't think that this is a problem. So using all that information, 
um, we were able to develop a prototype lateral flow assay. You can see here from, um, this is testing a live frog, kind of swabbing his legs. Um, but first we started with some testing on frozen archives. So these are frogs that had been, um, I believe they came from one of our zoos, our zoo partners, um, and they had been previously diagnosed infected with PCR, but they had kept the carcasses um, in the freezer for future research. Um, they were about 10 years old, but we were able to thaw them and predict um, or determine which nine were infected. And then there were 26 non-infected samples as well. So you can see from that, that picture, it's quite a weak signal, but bearing in mind this frog is about an inch big. So it's quite small and you know it had been infected over 10 years prior and then freeze thawed over the years. So we were quite um, quite chuffed that it worked. We also tested um, from live archives from many of our partners. So everybody, um, a lot of the community very graciously let us come swab their animals. Um, and that was to make sure, if I mentioned in the beginning that, you know, so many different species of frog and each one has its own unique um, antimicrobial peptides on the surface, unique microbiota on the surface. So we wanted to test all of them or as many as we could to make sure that the test didn't cross react um, with anything else. And actually we did in the end test over 300 animals across 90 species. Um, and we're sitting at about a 97% predictive accuracy. So that means we had nine false positives out of 300 animals. Um, ongoing work, there are, there were and are collaborators that were doing field tests across the globe in various different countries um, to try to determine more about what this positive predictive accuracy was. I can't say that I know a lot about this. By this time, um, being a postdoc, I had migrated on to a different project. Um, but if it's something you're interested in, I'd be happy to put you in contact with the team that um, is still doing this. So kind of summing up everything we've talked about thus far, BD is contributing to global amphibian decline. So it's this waterborne fungus that's really attracted to keratin. We think it's traveled across the globe on the back of the global amphibian trade, both for scientific research, possibly for food and for pets. It's really difficult to diagnose on site if you think hiking up to a remote mountain location to look at a population of frogs as our very first picture um, that Joel was doing and getting up there and just finding a field of dead frogs, or you see a bunch of frogs that are lethargic. Um, it's really difficult to know what they died from or you know why they're acting a bit funny. So we developed a rapid point of care diagnostic test um, use that to identify a carbohydrate biomarker that's both on the surface of the fungus of the fungus in great, great abundance all over the surface, um, but also shed into culture. And then we developed a prototype lateral flow assay that detects BD in a variety of infected and non-infected amphibian species. And I think this template can be really useful going forward when thinking about diagnostics, um, especially point of care diagnostics. Um, often we think of things, you know, like the COVID test um, for people, but actually the technology can be used in a variety of situations um, not just treating medical um, illness in humans. I do have to give a very big thank you to the team, um, especially um, this gentleman right here in the middle, uh, Professor Chris Thornton, who brought me onto the team to help with the project. And this was a project between Exeter and the Whitley Wildlife Conservation Trust at Peyton Zoo. So that's Andy there, and of course, Jamie Stevens as well. Um, but everybody contributed in some way um, and helped them. We wouldn't have been able to do it without the team effort. Of course, I also have to just give a very big thank you to all of our other collaborators, um, including the Leverhulme Trust for funding this. 
um, you know, Exeter for hosting me and all of the zoos and, and conservation societies that lent us their animals and let us swap them to make sure that things were working well. And I'd also like to thank Wikimedia Commons for all of the beautiful pictures of fungi that I've been showing you guys. Um, again, I'm no longer at Exeter. I'm now based at the University of Plymouth, uh, the Peninsula Medical School. But if it's something you're interested in, please get in touch. Kind of um, in the introduction, I currently teach on undergraduate medicine, but I also do research on waterborne disease and um, act as a consultant for point of care diagnostics. So if you'd like to talk, I'd be happy to talk. Or if you, you're really interested in the frogs, send me an email and I'll put you in touch with the team at Exeter that was working on this. And thank you everyone for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. That was an excellent presentation. Apart from using them as food and pets, I never thought that the frogs served so many purposes. In fact, yeah, we have one question from Grinson. He has asked that when frog population came down, the amount of pests increased and a lot of organochlorine pesticides were also used in agriculture. Whether they were responsible for the frog decline further? So I don't know specifically, I can't say specifically if, it, if the um, organic chlorine pesticides, I would say that I wouldn't be surprised. Um, there is a lot of correlation between pesticide use and amphibian declines. And especially when we begin to consider this in the wider global health um, kind of sense. So for example, um, it's been shown that certain farms, uh, tea farms or tree, uh, tea plantations in Sri Lanka um, have to spray pesticides to keep pests down, but then those pesticides actually kill the frogs. And then as the frogs populations decline, there's more pests and they have to spray more pesticides and the frog population decline further. So I don't, so I can't comment on specific pesticides, um, but I do know that there is a correlation between pesticides and frog decline. Thank you. And uh, since BD is such a problematic fungus, does it have a zoonotic potential? I think um, what we've seen is it's not really cross-reactive in other species. There's a few um, limited cases where it's been found in fish or where it's been found in like on the feet of waterfowl. So if they go swimming or they're walking through, you know, a marsh, um, BD can infect on their feet, but it doesn't seem to negatively impact their life. Fish, that fish it definitely does. Fish it can, it will kill. Um, but like waterfowl, yeah, it doesn't seem to really negatively impact them too much. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I have a question. I'm not, I wasn't supposed to, to make questions. Can I ask a question? <laughs> of course, yeah, yeah, please. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've been to Puerto Rico, I mean, for these New Year Eve, I mean, and the cocky frogs are everywhere. <laughs> I mean, we, we have, I mean, the young forest, they have more than 10 different species and the, the symphony they play them I mean, the male mating calls during the whole night is fantastic. <laughs> I mean, does this disease also, I mean, impact cocky frogs as well? I mean, it's every frog can suffer from this disease? Yeah, no, that's actually a really great question. And I should have co probably covered it a bit more in the um, presentation. So it does not cause disease in every frog. Um, so for example, it kind of, let's say co-evolved with Xenopus um, in South Africa and Xenopus doesn't get sick. It doesn't seem to be that bothered. Um, and some other species as well, they are resistant. Um, they don't seem to become infected. And we think that has to do down to the specific, you know, um, that specific species immunology, sort of um, how they see fungal infections. 
again, it's a little, it's a weak area of research. I think there's not a lot of research into it, but it has been kind of narrowed down. We do know that there's some something that different species of frog respond in a different way. Um, and again, probably because they haven't seen it before um, or seen, you know, been subjected to related sort of fungal pathogens. Okay, thank you. So what we find um, is actually a lot of the more susceptible species are the same species that are susceptible to things like global warming, where they have very, um, very narrow ecological niches and they don't do well outside of that niche. Um, so, for example, tropical frogs, they really struggle, you know, even a degree or two yeah. out of their comfort zone, and they are the types that end up being more susceptible as well to BD. Yeah, okay, thank you. And one more question? Sure. Okay. And uh, you showed the global distribution of BD, mm -hmm. and we found that in India, in our place, that is the southwest coast we have that the distribution of BD. So uh, in relation to water quality, because we see that the source poles are uh, released continuously. So does the water quality has any relation with the growth or the survival of the fungus? Yeah, if I'm honest, I don't know. I, I would imagine so. Um, we do know that, that BD can, Sort of spores form spores. Those, those sporangium can be quite resistant, um, or the zoospore can burrow in and then just hang out for a while until it finds, you know, until conditions are better for it to continue to grow. So, but if I'm honest, I don't know um, in terms of water quality. Um, yeah. In fact, what I meant was that whether the temperature or variation temperature, high temperature. Is the other sporangia able to withstand high temperature for quite a long time or in definitely, stagnant water? Definitely warmer temperatures will make it grow faster, you know, to an extent. Once it gets too hot, it'll, it won't grow as fast, but definitely like having a warmer water will make it grow faster. Thank you. Any more questions? I said, what I'll do is I'll throw my email into the chat as well. Um, and I said, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to um, yeah. get in yeah, touch. Because, yeah, because uh, almost an equal number or more number may be watching the program on YouTube. <laughs> because Air Center live streams has a live streaming facility and we have more viewers on the YouTube channel rather than direct attendance here. So well, I'll, I'll throw that up again. So it's just michael.dillon at plymouth.ac.uk. Um, that way, you, if you can't see the chat on Zoom, you can see the see my email address there. Okay, so, so Milton. Thank you, Nadine. So I just uh, wanna, to thank uh, Mike Dillian for agreeing to present this webinar today. Indeed, uh, kicking off the 2023 Onward and Air Center series. Yeah. And thanks also to the Air Center staff, colleagues, José Moutinho, Catarina, for their great uh, help with the organization, hosting and outreach. And also to everyone who was able to register and watch online or even later from YouTube or on the Air Center and Onward web pages. And uh, we look forward to announcing upcoming 2023 events soon, including other webinars, training courses, and this symposium hosted by the Travel Applied Science Foundation. And more information about it can be obtained from the web pages. And uh, I think that is more or less what I have to say for now. Thanks everyone again. Perhaps Shuba wants to comment on something. Uh, anyway, I'll pass the floor back to Nandini. Can you hear me? Yes, can you? yes, yes, we can. Oh, okay. Uh, Michael, just wanted to thank you for a really interesting presentation. It was all brand new. I had no idea that there was such a um, 
severe we, we are not sorry we are not able to hear you you are some connectivity issues are there yeah her network is poor and Yeah, and Michael is a partner, is our partner in the upcoming Welcome Trust project, as well as in the ongoing Vigin project. So it's good to know you more and okay, good to work with you. Look forward to working with you. We have other partners of the project also here. Anas and Grinson, the one who asked the question, he is also a partner here. And of course, Milton, Shubha, the leader. Gemma, she's all here. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me to talk. It's been, um, I know it's a bit of an old project, but it's always a bit fun because it's so different. So it's a nice one to talk about. And I'm definitely looking forward to working with you guys um, on the upcoming Welcome Trust project. Okay. So I, I think Shubha is not able to join back. So shall we wind up, Milton? Yes, uh, Nandini, please do so. Yeah. Okay, so once again, thanks a lot, Michael, for the interesting lecture. And uh, as usual, the efficient support from Air Center, Jose and Katerina. A big thank you to you and to the audience who have been hearing us directly or through the YouTube. Thank you all. And let us meet again for another webinar of Onward. Happy New Year. May the year be a good one for all of you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, Michael. Fantastic presentation. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. Bye.